merciful God. Yesterday, people across many nations paused to remember the end of the Second World War, in particular, the end of the conflict in Asia and the Pacific, a conflict that saw much brutality and much needless suffering inflicted on so many. We remember the many lives lost and the lifelong physical and mental scars that many, many people suffered. Yet amongst the horror, there are also courage, comradeship and endurance against the odds. And so we thank you for all those who served with such fortitude, whose courage helped to secure freedom for the decades ahead. We pray that we will continue to learn the lessons from this war, that nations will seek to live in harmony. Help us to follow the example of your son, the Prince of Peace. We are grateful that we have not seen another conflict like this, and that former foes are now able to work together peacefully. Yet we are very conscious that in this fallen world, much suffering remains. We continue to pray for our planet amidst the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Grant wisdom to those in leadership, insight to the scientists, protection to those who are vulnerable and those who make themselves vulnerable in order to help others. We pray for those affected by the cluster at Bannerman High School. Bring them through safely, Lord, we pray. God of hope and healing. There are many more in our community who are suffering for different reasons, grieving the loss of loved ones, dealing with other illnesses or a burden of care, facing financial distress or broken relationships, dealing with addiction or simply feeling overwhelmed by fear and anxiety. We bring them all before you now in a moment of silence. Loving God, you are the only one who can make sense of suffering. You help us to grow through it, yet you give us the assurance that one day it will pass and that we will be safe with you forever. We thank you that Jesus makes this possible and we ask you to hear our prayers for his sake. Amen. Last week, we heard how Gideon had an encounter with the angel of the Lord. And at the end of their conversation, Gideon puts down a sacrificial offering on a stone in front of the angel, who touches it with his staff, causing flames to burst forth and consume the offering. Then the angel disappears, leaving Gideon terrified. But the Lord reassures him, leading Gideon to build an altar to God, which he names, The Lord is Peace. But the Lord has a job for Gideon to do, and so he decides to strike while the iron is hot, to encourage Gideon to move forward whilst he's still full of awe, yet also has this sense of peace. And so the Lord speaks to Gideon again later that night. And we'll hear what he said as the McChesney family read to us from Judges chapter 6, starting at verse 25. That same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. Well, I don't think Gideon's sense of peace would have lasted too long. The angel of the Lord had helped Gideon return to worship, true worship of the God of Israel. Now he's going to get Gideon to put his house in order, to bring his household back, worshipping the Lord. Except that 
Gideon isn't the head of the household. His father is. And his father, Joash, hasn't just been a bit lax in worshipping the Lord. He's gone for full on idolatry. He set up an altar to Baal or, or Baal, depending on how you pronounce it. Anyway, the Canaanite storm god, as well as a wooden pole used in the worship of the fertility goddess Asherah. Now, you might be wondering what relevance this story has for today. OK, we, we have some statues in, in various places that we've seen recently how they can provoke very strong feelings. But we don't actually have folk bowing down and worshipping them as idols. But an idol can be anything that usurps God's place in our devotion. Anything that we put more of our heart, soul, mind and strength into into following and following the Lord. And a quick look at a, a celebrity gossip magazine reveals how idolatry is still alive and well today as fans obsess over every little bit of news or speculation about their favourite musician or actor or sports star. You see, we don't have to bow down or say your prayers to an idol in order to be worshipping it. We just need to be treating it with more attention, with more passion than it deserves, placing more value on it than we do on the Lord. We might not say so, but if we look at where our time, our energy and our finances are going, they may tell a different story. Because as Joe, I should find out, it's very easy to just go along with the culture all around us, to get on board with what everyone else seems to be doing. And back at the start of this series, we talked about the danger of absorbing the values of the culture around us in an uncritical fashion. But I want to take things to a deeper level and ask a more challenging question. If the Lord sent Gideon to your household today, what are the idols that he would need to take down? And as you think about that, there are a couple of points that I want to make clear. Firstly, an idol isn't necessarily a bad thing. It can be something that is good, but that has assumed too much importance in your life. Something that you are more focused on than you are on God. So it's good to encourage your children to work hard and achieve success. But if that becomes the be all and the end all, then there's a problem. And it's good to be fit and healthy. But if you're spending so much time exercising and reading about health and fitness and constantly trying to improve your performance, so much so that God doesn't really get a look in, then you're letting fitness become an idol. It's got too much hold over your life. Now, if you're a professional athlete, things are maybe a little different. But the words of Paul to Timothy on the subject still apply. Physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Now, the second point is that sometimes we don't need to destroy something we've turned into an idol. Sometimes we can redeem it for the Lord. Perhaps you're a bit of a chocolate addict. Often you're craving the taste of it, and sometimes it it leads you to make poor choices. But instead of treating it as a guilty pleasure, suppose you make a point of thanking the Lord for every time you have some. And also, and this is the hard bit, you start listening to the Holy Spirit when he drops a wee thought into your head to remind you that you don't really need to eat that 200 gram bar all in one go. But if you can take that approach, then it's not an idol anymore, but it's part of your worship of the Lord. You're bringing it under God's direction and giving him thanks for it. As Paul told the Corinthians, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now, not everything can be redeemed in that way. For some people, the temptation to overindulge may be so strong 
it's better just to smash up the idol, as it were, to give up chocolate or whatever it is. Um, anything that's got an unhealthy hold over you. And there are some guilty pleasures that definitely can't be redeemed because they are inherently sinful. If internet pornography is the thing that has a hold over your attention, then that is an idol that definitely needs to be smashed. But the important thing to remember is that while some activities are beyond redemption, people are not. The blood of Christ can remove the stain of any sin. We just need to put our faith in him. So let's keep thinking about that challenging question. If the Lord sent Gideon to your household today, what are the idols that he would need to take down? But back in the land of Israel, the idols that Gideon had to take down were the altar to Baal and the Asherah pole. And it seems very likely that these idols weren't simply used by Joash and his family, but that many of the other people in the town also worshipped there. And Gideon isn't simply tasked with destroying these idols. He's to replace them with an altar to the God of Israel. And then to take one of his father's prize bulls and sacrifice it on the new altar as an act of worship to the Lord. And just to show what the Lord thinks of this Asherah pole, the wood from it is to be used as the fuel for the fire for the sacrifice. And so Gideon is very scared. His father is going to be deeply unhappy on several fronts and the townspeople are liable to lynch him. But the amazing experience of worship that he'd had earlier that day has given him the courage to do what the Lord is asking him. However, as the Lord wasn't specific about the timing, he decides to go at night in the hope that no one sees him. And so he takes ten servants and does exactly what the Lord had instructed. And then he faced what must have felt like a very long wait until people saw the evidence of his handiwork at daybreak. And we'll hear what happened next as we continue the reading. In the morning when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. The people of the town demanded of Joash, Bring out your son, he must die, because he's broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, Are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jerob Baal that day, saying, Let Baal contend with him. As expected, the townspeople are just horrified by what has happened, and they make inquiries, and someone snitches on Gideon. So a lynch mob assembles outside Joash's house, demanding that Gideon be brought out and put to death. And Gideon is inside, wondering what his father will do. After all, Gideon hasn't just destroyed these idols. By doing so, he's disrespected his father. Will he just hand his son over to the angry mob? But Gideon's actions have awoken his father's conscience. Deep down, he knows Baal isn't a real god, that really he should be worshipping only the Lord. He knows he's been guilty of just following the crowd and falling into sinful idolatry. And so he confronts the angry crowd and challenges them about their worship of Baal. He basically tells them, if Baal really is a god, he doesn't need you to fight his battles for him. He can deal with Gideon himself. And... Remarkably, the angry mob listen to this argument and they accept it. And they give Gideon a nickname, Jerobaal, which means let Baal contend with him. It doesn't sound quite so snappy in English, but it's a name that will show 
just how powerless Baal really is as time goes by. Each day that Gideon is alive and prospering shows more clearly that Baal is utterly incapable of contending with Gideon, that Baal is indeed a false god. And so the angel of the Lord has helped Gideon to worship God. Gideon, through his actions according to the Lord's instructions, has helped his father, Joash, turn away from idolatry. And Joash gives everyone in the town food for thought, encouraging them to abandon their idols. A very different result to what Gideon thought would happen. But that's the power of God at work. Gideon found the courage to obey the Lord, and the Lord did the rest, bringing some unexpected results. And the Lord is still doing that today. I was at a conference last summer and one of the speakers was Eddie Lyle, who works for the Open Doors Trust, a charity that seeks to support the persecuted church around the world. And Eddie shared a story about a 24 year old Christian woman in northern China. She had recently got a job with a mining company and her job involved ringing the bell that signalled when it was time for lunch. And at that point, all the miners would come out of the mine for their lunch break. But one day, she felt very strongly that the Lord was telling her to ring the bell early. It was an hour before lunchtime. She was sure that she'd get into big trouble if she rang the bell then. But a sense that the Lord was wanting her to ring the bell was very, very strong. And so she obeyed. She rang the bell and all the miners started coming to the surface. And when they realised that it was an hour before lunchtime, they weren't best pleased. They were all on a piece rate. That's how they got their pay. So if they lost an hour's production, their meagre pay would be even lower than usual. And a crowd of big, burly and very angry men gathered around the young woman. The miners were shouting at her. Why did you ring the bell early? She blurted out, my God told me to. The miners weren't impressed. It looked like things were about to get ugly. Then, suddenly, a violent earthquake struck the area. The miners watched the mine collapse before their eyes. Suddenly, the mood changed, and the crowd were much more willing to hear about the God that this woman mentioned. 400 of them came to faith and many lives were saved. All because this young woman did what the Lord asked her to do. Now we may not find ourselves in such a dramatic situation, but we may still find that the Lord is asking us to do something that we find a bit scary, something where we can only imagine a bad outcome. But if we're faithful, we may be surprised or even amazed at what the Lord will do as a result. And that brings me to the second question for today. Is there something challenging that the Lord is asking you to do? Maybe there's something that you need to put right in your own household. Maybe it's time to take a stand for him at work or to share your faith with someone whom you don't expect to listen. And that can feel very scary. But if that's where God is leading you, then trust him to go ahead of you to prepare your path. And you might just see surprising results. But we'll need the Holy Spirit's help to hear the Lord's voice and also to find the courage to respond. So let's ask God for that help just now. Let us pray. Holy and eternal God. We thank you for the story of Gideon, for the way that you helped him to worship you and for the way that you helped him to put his own house in order, to deal with the idols that had taken your rightful place. And so we ask that you would help us in that same way, that your spirit would inspire our worship and help us to see any idols in our lives. Grant us the wisdom and the courage to take them down or to redeem them for you. 
And we thank you, Lord, that you have purposes for each of us. Help us to perceive what those purposes are and grant that we may have the courage to follow your will, to do our part in obedience and to trust you with the consequences. Help us, Lord, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Go go forward into the week ahead, following the Lord's leading and putting him first in all things. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.